tall people. The title for today's talk is How to Draw the Elephant in the Room. But as I stand here in front of you, I'm perhaps thinking I should have gone in a different direction. Don't get me wrong, man. I love elephants. I've drawn lots of them. They're beautiful and they're steadfast. And who have they ever heard? Except maybe a mouse. But the things that I've drawn over the last three years have not been beautiful. I've drawn ugly things and things that have hurt people very badly. I've spent the last three years traveling around the beautiful and terrible parts of the world, drawing ugly things. So maybe I should have called this lecture Drawing the Emperor Naked, even when he thinks he's wearing clothes. I'm an artist and a writer. I've carved out a niche traveling around the world to prisons and refugee camps, to protest scenes and conflict zones, to places where things are kicking off and then taking out my sketch pad and documenting them. I've gone to Syria, Guantanamo Bay. I just got back from a few weeks in Iraqi Kurdistan. I've shared hot pink cigarettes with snipers in Lebanon. And I've sat on a balcony in Gaza while Israel cruelly and arbitrarily bombed the Strip. Despite this, my roots are not in hard news, but in nightlife. And I spent my formative years drawing nightclubs, sex workers, and the sequin spangled beautiful men and women of the demi monde. My first book, Drawing Blood, as uh, was so kindly mentioned, is coming out in December. And it's about both these parts of my life, as well as what it means to draw really mean pictures of naked emperors. And writing a book was the hardest thing I'd ever done. At a pen DIY, I'm supposed to have some lessons for you, some, some steps, right? And I'm often asked to give lessons and steps. And it always, it always boggles me because artists, right, we're the prototypical freaks of the world. We are the people who are too weird to scale. Our paths are all unrepeatable because we're just too damn strange. And despite the lies of art school, you cannot break down what any artist or any writer does into a four-year curriculum that will provide a good education for 500 little mini artists who will come out at the end with a good job. It's impossible. We're too weird. But nonetheless, here's what I've learned, I think, from my freakish, circuitous, difficult, but often fascinating career. I hope it's useful. Step one, get into trouble. Like maybe half you guys here in the room, I was a terrible student. Uh, my mother is here in the audience, she can confirm this. And I was not just a bad student, I, uh, I was an insufferable, really, really pretentious brat too. It's true. But most particularly, there's something in my brain that prevented me from sitting down, looking ahead obediently and paying attention. If I had had to do that every day, eight hours a day for 10 years, I probably would have preferred to have stabbed a pen into my eyeball. This may be why I never got an office job. So, when I was stuck in the torture of sitting in school, I kept myself busy by drawing. I filled every test and worksheet with drawings. I handed in my algebra exam, my final algebra exam, filled with nothing but mermaids. I, uh, I drew uh, Joseph Stalin's henchmen all across something that was supposed to be for pre-calc. I would have teachers that would hold up my, uh, my worksheets in the beginning of the class and be like, look at the mess Molly made. I drew and I drew and I drew. I drew, uh, even though I was punished for drawing in class by uh, something called in-school suspension, which meant that they would uh, lock us in a little room with no windows and we'd have to stare at the wall for eight hours. It was really, it was, it was bad. And because uh, white kids who are rebellious get uh, medicalized while um, black kids who are normal get criminalized, um, I was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, which is, and it's true, it's, it's, I think it's the, uh, the clinical term for being incapable of sitting down and shutting up and refraining from drawing all those mean pictures all over everything. And so I got diagnosed with this, I went to a lot of shrinks, I went to another school, I went back to another school, tried to put me on lithium, I did not get into any good colleges whatsoever. And I was labeled an at-risk troubled girl. But through it all I drew. I drew and I drew and I drew. I'm not saying this because I think I'm a genius. I didn't draw well. I sucked, actually. I think it, uh, from the time I first started drawing to the time I first did something another human should look at, it was maybe 20 years. But I had this monomania about it, this obsession. For me, to draw was like picking scabs off your arm. It was like popping zits or something. I, I mean, it wasn't even good what I was making, but I had to, you know, I, I needed to. 
And the time that I felt most compelled to draw was when I was least allowed to do it. So why am I telling you about my failure at conventional education as a lesson? Because I want to tell you something. Despite the lies of other people, art is fucking hard. Art sucks. You, if you're an artist, you want to do this because you know what something beautiful is, but it'll be like a decade before you can make that yourself, and every single day to be an artist will just be confronting your own failures and horror shows and little monsters. But you're going to do it anyway because you're an artist, right? And if you don't develop that sort of straight back that it takes to walk up to some authority figure and tell him that he's wrong, how are you ever going to look your own demons in the head? How are you ever going to keep standing upright in the face of constant sneering and rejection? You'll never soldier on until you're actually good enough. Trouble is the best school for an artist. Caravaggio was a criminal and so was Goya. Criminals are always cooler than obedient graduates of MFA programs with nicely ironed shirts, I think. Though it, the categories aren't mutually exclusive. Being the bad kid teaches you to work for internal compulsion, not external reward. It teaches you to charm and to exist outside the boundaries of authority. It teaches you to draw the emperor with no clothes. Step two, be both subject and object. So I mentioned I did nev never worked an office job, and that was because during the usual years that people are working day jobs, I worked as a naked model. And I didn't work like as a cool like playboy naked model or you know, anything prestigious, no, no, no. I worked as a naked girl for hire, where anytime someone needed like sort of a random body, I would show up. I, one of them was um, hanging around, lying on my back in a parking lot on a bikini while live crickets were poured on my face. Um, another one was posing with a lot of hard-boiled eggs for a um, Hasidic guy in uh, the Bronx who, um, and afterwards I was kind of broke and I said, uh, can I take some of these home? <laughs> um, I, I also did some fun gigs like posing as a human statue at a party or once I actually posed as an artist model for the launch of a bohemian themed liquor, but they couldn't have any artists draw me because they thought artists were too unattractive. So instead, they hired, uh, they hired actors to draw stick figures the entire night. It was very meta. Mm -hmm. I, my main work, though, was just posing for endless sleazy guys in endless hotel rooms who really wanted to hire a stripper, but they didn't want to think of themselves as the type of the guy who would do that, and so the camera was the excuse. It was sometimes glamorous, but mostly a grind and a drag, but it paid $100 an hour, and it financed my art career. Most importantly, though, this was what gave me the intellectual background to do my work. Standing still, shutting up, contorting in some sort of socially agreed upon notion of sexy, pouting and pretending to look pretty and hiding your hate, it taught me to think harder, to be sharper, to use my pen like a razor. I would think of things in my head during those shoots and I would turn them over and over like rocks in a gem tumbler until they shone. So art is a paradoxical thing, right? It's half empathy, half objectification. Empathy, because without that, without knowing what's going on on the inside, how can you create anything? But objectification, because you take all that empathy, you take all that spying you've done in someone else's head, and then you put it outwards into a paper product or a book or you know, a big painting, and you benefit from it alone. There's this idea that the male gaze is this special, you know, magic, bad, objectifying gaze, but I think it's bullshit. I think that gaze that's so bad is an artist's gaze, because I felt it every time. I think the only reason we associated it with men was because men were the only people who were allowed to look that way. So, what I'm telling you, my lesson for you, is this. This gave me my muses. I found my muses in this community that was rather marginalized and definitely bad. God, I loved the women around me when I posed. I loved how we rebelled against the pallid good girl role society had laid out for us. We had burnt our innocence in a fire. We had forsaken protection. Instead, we had that precarious but dizzying freedom that comes from having cut off your moorings. And we also, at 19, had a middle class supply of cash. So what can you learn from this besides um, that underworld jobs are often better than retail? It's to do the other side of your work. Don't just be some 
iron fucking member of the professional class. Do the other side, the hard side, the shit side. The side that's looked down upon that's not respected. The side that isn't supposed to talk back. Be that. Because while you're not talking back, while you're being silent, that's when you think about the really good things. Also, remember this. While I was being an object on those tables, or those beds, or those model stands, I was just waiting for my turn to speak. There is no object and subject anymore. We all watch, we all are watched, we all listen and we all listen to. There is no community that you can ignorantly turn into your raw material and have them not talk back. There is no one who will remain blank and silent. They're all going to say you're dumb on Twitter and they'll probably be right. There is no other anymore. There is no muse like Degas had who could be trusted to stay over her laundry bucket or her ballet bar and never tell him what a creepy old man he was. We can all talk back now. We live in the death of context and the death of the passive audience and the people you portray will see what you do. You better hope that you did them right. Step three, find your palace. When I was 24, I got a job as the house artist of the fanciest, most depraved, most horrifying nightclub in New York City. It was the height of the financial crisis, and this was the sort of place where the people who destroyed the American economy would blow through $20,000 a night on champagne just to show they could. It was the sort of place where the underground performers I posed alongside did acts about murdering their customers. It was a nightclub as class war. I used my art, as I always did, as a scam to going into places I'm not supposed to go into. I took out my sketchbook really ostentatiously while I was in the club and I drew. Drawing this way is always a disruptive act. You're producing when you're expected to consume. So I was invited to be the Toulouse the Trek of this nightclub, and for years I spent days and days every week sitting on those steps Watching, watching these acts of such depravity and violence and beauty and talent. I watched Italian acrobats who had grown up in the circus do backflips over chainsaws, catching themselves with their feet so their head was only six inches above the blade. I watched my friend Rose Wood do an act where she was dressed like a cartoon sex worker, little hot pink lycra tube dress. There was a... There was a actor who's with her who's dressed like a customer and the whole act while she's taking him to bed and sleeping with him you hear his thoughts about what a brave man he is and you know how none of the guys at work would think that he was like that and how you know he was just so damn cool for hiring a sex worker and then she leaves him tied to the bed she takes off her dress she gets a knife she stabs him to death she lights the bed on fire. She takes off her wig, she's bald, and she stands there looking out at the audience with such fucking contempt in her eyes as if every single one of them was a total bastard and she knew it and she was saying it to them right there. And then she put on his suit and walked away. That was the sort of club it was. When the economy crashed, the club started to go a bit down with it. You know, it suddenly looked really bad to spend $20,000 a night on champagne just because it had a little sparkler in it. But they uh, decided to move on to the greener pastures of London, and they brought me with them, where I uh, spent weeks uh, working all night at a construction site, drawing pigs, snorting cocaine on the walls of uh, what used to be JoJo's strip club. And it was a funny thing, right, because I'm essentially doing, you know, I'm doing skilled labor, I'm painting walls, you know, I'm with the construction guys, we're all covered in dust and choking on green stuff that we cough out later and really, really cold all day. But they're not considered to be anything, they're just considered to be manual labor, they're nothing, whereas I'm supposed to be fucking fancy. But I think it was a lie. Art is blue collar labor combined with metaphysics. It has to be a fusion of the hand and the mind, and anything that demeans them and elevates me is just some sort of classist nonsense that I wanted no part in. But outside of the club, uh, London was uh, turning in on itself. Uh, they had just announced that they were gonna start charging American-style tuitions on schools, and the students responded by uh, smashing the Tory headquarters with their bare hands. I thought it, I thought it was a good response. And so it was in the middle of these anti-austerity protests. I'm painting 
gilded waitresses and pigs riding the symbols of England inside what's soon to be a club that Prince Harry does drugs at. And I started wondering, what side am I fucking on here? What side am I on? So then I went home and Occupy Wall Street happened around the street. If the box was my first palace, Zuccotti was probably my second. It was the place I would go every day to draw and to document, to see and to talk. A place that I couldn't even quite believe existed for a while. Since I lived nearly across the street, I turned my apartment into a mini press room. All of the journalists would mooch off of my liquor and use all my power outlets, stay warm there while they're churning out their copy. I would go down each day and draw protesters, and then I would uh, do protest posters in my apartment and uh, give the files to an Occupy, a girl from Occupy who would later run them off, and they would be on the streets being held by people within three hours. Felt a lot better than any museum I've ever been in. And I would go to every march that I could. And I say palace, right, even though these are moments in time rather than space, or maybe a fusion, but they were, it was like a palace too. But palaces, that's a funny thing, right? I, I use this word deliberately. A palace is not neutral. In fact, the most famous palace in the world, Versailles, was constructed as a trap. Louis XIV's goal in creating Versailles was to take all of this, these nobility that were holed up on their chateaus, which is just French for fortresses, and were constantly causing him trouble and trying to start wars, and say, and say no, leave the country, man. Leave those places. Go to court. Spend all your money on fancy parties. Any place you love too much, because I'm not criticizing palaces, but any place you love too much can become a trap. It can make you lose your critical thinking, your sharpness, your independence. It can make you just conform to it. Scenes are great, but don't be wholly part of any one of them. Find a place that makes you mad with love, a place that obsesses you and entices you. Do whatever you have to to get into it. And then stay there and betray it. And betray it as an act of worship first. I mean, you love this place, or an act of friendship, an act of love, and you know, get all of that bullshit out of your system. Then let yourself hate it, because every place has flaws and then get that out of your system too. And then go back to it with all that love and all that hate and all that disillusion and all that confusion and all that hope and see it as the flawed, bre precious, broken thing that it is and try to describe it as real as you can. Let all of that hope and disillusion and sweetness change you. See it with real eyes like you would an old and very dear friend. Step four, draw the disappeared. Through Occupy and uh, my rest at Occupy, I started to segue into writing, and then from there to journalism. Since then, I've gotten this, this strange space in my life where I ricochet around the world, uh, traveling from Greece to Guantanamo to wherever to wherever. I focused then, and I do now, on protesters and prisoners, sex workers and refugees, People who, in the media, are usually elided into symbols, but seldom ever seen as individuals. I had always used my art as a lockpick to the larger world, and now it was a way of taking these people and showing them as best I could. Because when you draw something right, you show that you care about it. Art is so slow and it's so hard to do it well. One project that I did recently was a series of drawings with a young Syrian writer named Marwan Hisham, who had spent a year living under ISIS. He would send me cell phone photos he had taken of the cosplay caliphate, and I would draw from them, and he would write essays. And in a war where every single horror that you could possibly imagine, you know, disemboweled children, everything, you know, chemical weapons, has been documented in cell phone photos, people told me that this had a power that they hadn't seen because it was taking the multiplicity and making it singular. But my first, uh, my first gig drawing that disappeared was probably the most explicit. Um, in 2013, I convinced the military to allow me to go down to Guantanamo Bay. Now, Guantanamo Bay is not just censored. Guantanamo Bay is censorship. Photographing there is like playing Twister. The army says, oh, you, can, you, know, you can't have a ceiling, and you can't have a camera, and you can't have this many doors and no faces. And before you know it, you're pointing your camera at the floor, or else they'll delete it right off of, right off of the camera itself. But I'm an artist. I can draw around censorship. When they told me I couldn't draw the guards, I gave them death masks. 
just sort of like a smiley face, but horizontal line. When they told me I couldn't draw the prisoners, I scribbled out where their heads would be in angry black. I wanted to draw the censorship itself. When I was in court uh, drawing Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was separated from us by two layers of bulletproof glass so that he would not um, steal our notebooks and uh, garret us with the wire, that was the, that was the reason. Uh, he was separated from us with two layers of bulletproof glass, but I still had my uh, opera glasses taken because the army said that they were prohibited ocular amplification. I just wanted to get his face right. And all of this erasure has a really certain purpose. If you don't think of these people as men, if you don't think of these people as human beings who have wives and kids and back pains and grudges and bullshit beliefs and kindnesses and very wise things in their mind and favorite soccer teams and books they love, then it's much easier to think of them as boogeymen, as not humans but empty orange jumpsuits that you have to lock up forever so they don't threaten you. And I was thinking about individuality because I recently, in September, went to Iraqi Kurdistan where I spent some time in Domiz, which is a refugee camp for Kurdish people who have fled Syria. And it's a place that's technically safe. Um, I mean, ISIS is about an hour away, but it's technically safe. But it's miserable. It's, it's terrible. It's just like this panoply of dust and tents and open sewage and no electricity in Iraq. You can know how it get hot that gets in the summer. And these are people from you know, great cities of the world, like Damascus and Aleppo, who are, have been living in tents for years. And so every one of those people who I spoke to either was actively about to get on a death boat to Europe or was planning on it but just didn't have the money, all of them. No one wanted to stay there. And they knew all the risks. They knew about Hungary. They knew about capsized boats. There was a giant painting of um, Alan Al-Kurdi, the, the boy who drowned on the way to Domiz, but it wasn't that they didn't know that, but they were just so desperate to live, to have the lives that they had planned on that they didn't care. They would rather drown on a boat than not live. One woman told me that. She said, you know, we could die quick on the way over or die slowly here. And I wanted to draw those people as individuals too, not as members of some mass that's forced to walk like animals across a continent because people won't allow them to buy plane tickets because of their passports. Now, when I say I dr to draw the disappeared, or, I'm specifically not saying something else. I'm not saying give voice to the voiceless. Fuck giving voice to the voiceless. No one is voiceless now. Every single one of us comes equipped with a voice. And the only reason people can't hear it is because they're ignoring it or they're deliberately silencing it. Your art, your writing is not a charity. You are doing no one a favor by portraying them. No, I say that draw the disappeared for another reason. Because... If you listen to people who aren't usually listened to, they might have the most interesting things to say. Step five, draw words and write pictures. I was doing the little Shill de Beast promo dance for this book and you know, doing interviews in my studio. And this interviewer asked me, Molly, what do you do? And I, I looked around, my studio is filled with evidence of doing things, which is, you know, lots of empty booze bottles and coffee cups and crumpled up failed drawings and printed out drafts of stuff like this, and I'm, I'm a bit confused. And he said, I mean, you, you, you draw, but you write. I mean, what do you do? And then I get it. He wants me to sum myself up in one word. And I try and I try and I try, but I just, I can't do it. I can't make myself. I don't judge anyone who, focused, who focuses. In fact, I admire them. Monastic focus is a beautiful thing. There's something wonderful in a simple white china teacup or an Eames chair. But I have always loved complexity, maximalism, and chaos. I answered the interviewer that I both write and draw, but I forget to say that they're not separable. I'm an artist since I was born, and I've been writing for one month and three years. But art taught me to write. It made me to hunger to write, because art was vague and it whispered, whereas writing was explicit, and if you wanted to, it could scream. Art taught me a craftsman's discipline, a lack of preciousness, a work ethic that brutalized me. Maybe the only thing I don't do is sleep. But the world is too much, and this is my one life, and this is your one life, too. 
And I want to consume the world with greedy gulps, like, that, like you consume that first glass of whiskey when you want to start the night right. A few weeks ago, I was at the Plaza Hotel. It was 5 a.m. after a party. I'd been up all night drinking whiskey, just like I described. And now it was the, it was the dawn's dregs. It had been a party just for women, and I sat slumped next to some flaxen-haired lovely writer who was writing a very good book that would justly be very big very soon. And me and her spoke about our work. As I staggered out, I thought about how little boundaries mattered, especially in the face of love. In that New York morning, I just knew I loved those women. Those women who were bad by virtue of their muchness. Those too smart, too sharp, too strong, too beautiful women who have spent the night toasting their own victories and passed out in the dawn's weak light, safe amongst each other. I loved them that morning with a ferocious ache, and I wished them all the glory of the city. And maybe this is my last bit of advice for you. Embrace that muchness in yourself. The world, the critics, the bosses, the everything, they want to shape us into branded properties, serious or frivolous, intellectual or sexy, this or that. What they will never accept is that we are artists. We are amoral aesthetic gluttons. We are monsters. We are chimeras. We only want to learn and create in this vast, beautiful, terrible world. So my advice to you, fuck them. Fuck their limits and fuck specialization. Fuck deciding this or that. Fuck anything that would confine you. This is your one life. And life is too precious to cut off pieces of yourself. I'm going to end this talk by asking you to do one thing. It might be an art assignment or a life assignment. I don't even know if there's a difference in between them. But it goes like this. Draw the emperor naked or the elephant or whatever metaphor you want to use. But use your art to question all cops, all bosses, all gods, and all masters, including those inside your head. As you do it, embrace all those jagged bits of yourself, your life, the parts that don't fit, that let you see like no one else ever could. Give up nothing. Don't be afraid. Thank you. Thank you.